Now, while Houston may feel like it goes on forever, in truth, it doesn't. And where Houston ends, other towns begin, each with their own history and spirit that have nothing to do with H-Town, other than the fact that they're just down the road. And today, we're gonna have a ball. Tom Ball! This episode was made for y'all with the help of our awesome partners. Check the caption for more info. With Houston just 30 miles away, Tomball sometimes gets outshined by the bright lights of the Bayou City. Which is a shame, because while street lamps don't shine as brightly, they can illuminate something just as fun to explore. Let's start our trip with a history lesson on how Tomball became Tomball, a story that goes all the way back to the coming of the railroad, and how that development changed this town forever. They love the railroad so much here that they even renamed the town from Peck, Texas, think farm and chickens, to Tomball, Texas, in honor of the man who brought the railroad, Mr. Thomas Henry Ball. Tom Ball. He even got his first and last name in the town. That's awesome. It'd be like Chet Garner, Texas, but one word like Chet Garner. Chet Garner. Chet Garner. It's got a ring to it, huh, Tom? Yeah, I like that. And while he may look original, tour guide Ken Walden isn't. But man, can he play the part. Yeah, well, everybody says, uh, is the beard real? And says, the beard's real, I'm fake. Oh, okay. you know, but, uh, <laughs> you know. Welcome, Chet, to the Tomball Railroad Museum. This was the first structure in Tomball, which uh, was called a tank town originally. Tank town means there was a water station here for the steam engines, which is their fuel. So uh, this is what it looked like 107 years ago now. Uh, we tried to put it back in its original configuration and format. The company that did the restoration here is a restoration company. They took paint scrapings, from what I understand, and got the original colors. So inside and out, this is the way it looked 107 years ago. When you walked in here to catch a train, this is, this is how it was. So stepping into the depot is stepping back in time. And the small details are what really set this place apart. Yeah, Chet, this is our telegraph key. Uh, as you can see, this is actually working. This coil, this whole apparatus is working the way that it did 130 years ago. After this was utilized mainly for train orders, since there were no radios in the trains. Morse code is a mystery to me. I just hear a bunch of sort of incessant clicking and the fact that that can be translated is baffling. Yeah. Well, to tell the truth, it's that for me too. Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> this item here in the Depot Museum is one that attracts a lot of attention because it kind of puts the, the time period to life. You know, it gives us some life. Absolutely. Morse code is definitely a lost art, like railway travel itself. But it was a glorious day when the railroad came to Tomball. Suddenly, a rural farm community was connected to the rest of the world. And to explore how Tomball began to change, we're headed up the road to the Tomball Museum Center. This collection of historic buildings date from the mid-1800s to the mid-1900s and tell even more of the story of Tomball. But agriculture and railroad aside, what really took this town to the next level happened in 1933 with good old Texas Tea, a story encapsulated by this 1940s oil camp house. So these homes were built by the oil companies to accommodate the workers and their families. They were essentially built on an assembly line, one after another, all in a row. Standard got two bedrooms, however, if you were a supervisor or a manager, you got three with an extra off the back. Houses needed to go up quick as Tomball's population tripled during the oil boom. And residents here got more than just houses. So they discovered oil in Tomball in 1933, and they discovered a lot of it. So much, in fact, that the city was able to negotiate free water and gas for all of its residents for almost 90 years. Now that's a good use of natural resources right there. Because of this, Tomball earned its third name, Oil Town USA. But no matter what era of history you're looking for, this museum center has a house or structure just for it, including the bars from the old jail. <laughs> Watch this. Oh, hey, check this out. Yeah, right, just, just look in there for a second. It's pretty sure? awesome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, Richie. <laughs> Ah, oh, gotcha, you're stuck in jail. Oh, man. 
Dang, there's only bars on one side. That's no fun. Ah. Let's go. Well, that didn't work. But while we're on a history kick, let's find some lunch with the historic flair. You see, in an era past, dashing gentlemen, Tomball, beautiful, and classy ladies from all over the world. Oh, the rod has left me parched. I wonder where I can find a cup of tea. Would find themselves here in Tomball, deboarding at the train station. And they were hungry. For decades during the depot years, these people had no place to find lunch. I'm so famished. Oh. But luckily, about 90 years later, a place arrived in Tombald for classy ladies like this one here. Or something like that. And it was called the Whistle Stop Tea Room. Ah, yes. This feels much better. Now I know what you're thinking. Tea room? That's frou-frou lady stuff. No self-respecting man would step foot in there. Well, my friends, this is a Texas tea room with food no Texan man or woman should miss. Okay, so this is Cindy Vincic, owner of the Whistle Stop Tea Room. So uh, I see that you guys do let men into this tea room. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's not just for ladies. We That's specialize in lots of great things for men as well. That's why we call ourselves a Texas tea room. Our food is not teeny tiny, it's large sizes so everyone can enjoy it. Lots of great soup, sandwiches, salads, homemade desserts, best ones in town. I saw, I saw that case over there. That right. thing is dangerous. It is. So is it okay to eat that as the appetizer and then move on to the soup and sandwich? You certainly may. We have a lot of people walk in and reserve their dessert before they even sit down. <laughs> I want that because there's only one piece left. That's right. Oh, dessert. It's just one of the many local favorites. Okay. So what do you think about Whistle Stop? I love Whistle Stop. I'm here all the time. I've been here, coming here 18 years. What keeps you coming back? It's so happy in here. Everybody's happy. Okay, so what do we have in here? This is the yum yum pie. Is it yum yum? Oh, it's very yum yum. <laughs> it looks yum yum. <laughs> do you feel obligated to eat a meal to get to the dessert, or you yeah. just come for dessert? Yeah, I, I feel obligated, but the meal is good. <laughs> the meal is just good, as good. good. I'm glad to talk to a guy here at the tea room. Is this, or, or, I guess guys are allowed in here. Oh, absolutely, positive. And the chicken salad sandwiches that I die for, tortilla soup, and every soup that they have is awesome. Yeah, I've got no shame walking in this place, and no shame in the amount of food I'm about to consume. Now this is the way to do tea time. I got a sandwich and soup, but if you get a full sandwich, you can split it up between two halves. So for one, I got the California chicken, and underneath it, their house jalapeno pimento cheese. That is delicious. I mean, it would be an amazing chicken sandwich in its own right, but then you throw spicy pimento cheese on it, that sandwich has a lot going on in a good way. I have to remember my manners. I am in a tea room after all. See, this is fun when you get a lot of different things because you can just jump around between them. Homemade chicken salad, really good chicken, massive Texas toast sized bread. Any dude can feel proud eating this chicken salad sandwich right here. I definitely had to save room for dessert. I mean, I had that case just staring at me the whole time. So I got some of their homemade bread pudding, but it's made with croissants. That's my happy place right there. This day tripper will be the death of me, but I'll love every delicious bite of it. Now this is my kind of tea time, but now it's time for Main Street, the center of Tomball's historic district, full of specialty shops and antique stores including one that will take you back to the Wild West, Bob's Wild West. This store is a collection of history, horns, and guns. What could be more Texan than that? All sorts of items befitting a cowboy. Look at this little six-shooter revolver here. Perfect. Carry it right there. I do not want to be the horse underneath yeah. the cowboy. Pretty serious. It's wearing pretty these. <laughs> Man, check out some of these animals. Look at this guy. His tusks are actually turned back into his nose. He was killed in Texas, although I'm not so sure you could say the same thing about this baboon. And as a former Texas Ranger himself, owner Bob Platts has a collection befitting his own history. So this case is made up of Bob's private collection of guns, all owned by former Texas Rangers. And this one right here was at the final shootout of Bonnie and Clyde. Check out these pistols. I would carry guns like this if I were a Texas Ranger. This is like a little Texas Ranger Hall of Fame right here. 
This store attracts collectors from all over the world. But if you're really looking for firepower in Tomball, well, that's at the local airport, home of Tomball's own World War II Flying Fortress, Texas Raiders. We now interrupt this programming to remind you to like and subscribe. Now back to the road. Multiple times a year, the local CAF chapter has an air show and takes Texas Raiders out of the hangar to do what she was born to do, fly. And today, we're hitching a ride. Okay, so this is Don Price. He's the wing leader of the Commemorative Air Force Gulf Coast Wing. Well, I've seen a lot of antique weaponry, but never firepower this big. This is awesome. Yes, indeed. This is a four engine B-17 bomber. It carried 6,000 pounds of bombs and 12 50 caliber machine guns. Oh, wow. Over 12,000 B-17s were put into action, but today far less survive. So there's really nine that are actively flying right now. And we're talking in the country? We're talking in the world. Oh, whew, wow. Yeah. So it pretty much goes without saying that flying in a B-17 is the chance of a lifetime. To some of the World War II vets that visit, it's as real as it was 75 years ago. I tell you, it is touching to see them because some of them, it's like the first time they've been around a B-17 since World War II, and it never fails to bring memories back to them, which is why it makes it such a heartfelt job for us to go out and honor the veterans that survived that. It took a crew of 10 to fly a B-17. Pilots on top, bombardier in the nose, and gunners in the tail, on the sides, and even underneath. Can you imagine hanging underneath the plane in a rotating ball, shooting anything that's coming at you? Just not throwing up would be hard enough to not throw up and shoot all the German planes that are attacking you? Crazy. You know, my grandfather was a plane mechanic during World War II in England, and I would love to have him here to tell me how all this stuff worked. I could spend hours just exploring this plane, but they tell me it's time to fly, and the CAF crew already knows me too well, as they've got me a flight suit. Our mission awaits, so after a quick briefing, we board. During the worst parts of the war, B-17 crew members had a 25% chance of completing the required missions. But our odds today should be much better. Man, this is what it would have felt like taking off during World War II. It's about to get real loud. And we have liftoff. Oh, we have liftoff. <laughs> and once we hit cruising altitude, ding. We are now free to move about the cabin. This is awesome! They're actually letting us walk around, moving between the rooms, walking over the bomb bay doors, glad those aren't open, and staring over the pilots. I'm amazed at the freedom we have. Maybe a bit too much freedom. I wonder what these buttons do. Goodbye, Conroe! <laughs> I'm just kidding. Flying in a World War II plane is just something words don't do justice. But there's a perspective you get up here that I'm not sure you could get any other way. More than the physical perspective of Texas is the perspective you get of what it was like for the brave men who crewed these birds of war, risking their lives day in and day out for our freedom. And after about a half hour loop, it's time for our final descent. Oh man, that was awesome. That was excellent. And I only wish it was longer, but you get up there and you, you can see so much of Houston. Oh man, that was incredible. Now, if you haven't figured it out, Tom Ball loves its history. And even when you aim to spend some time away from the history books, you simply can't avoid it, as even the parks surround historic sites. So we're here beside Spring Creek, but at this site, there used to be a Confederate gunpowder mill. I say used to because one day while they were working in 1863, it exploded, killing all the employees inside. The blast left a crater so big that when it filled with groundwater, it became a popular local swimming hole. A swimming hole that many say is haunted. 
They fenced it off because they don't want anybody back there now, but uh, you know, I didn't bring my ghost proof swimsuit anyway, so we're gonna keep moving. I got one more park I wanna show you. There's another park that may be small, but packs one big story. The story of the fork in the road. So this is New Kentucky Park. It's the site of one of the most important moments of the Texas Revolution that nobody knows about. You see, as Houston led the Texian army and all the settlers in what's known as the runaway scrape, he reached this site and he had to make a decision. There were two roads. The road to the left was the road to Nacogdoches, which ultimately meant safety in Louisiana. The road to the right was the road to San Jacinto to face Santa Ana and the Mexican army head on. Houston hadn't told anybody what he was going to do. However, when he reached New Kentucky, without hesitation, he marched his men to the right. They cheered and he crystallized the Texan spirit just like that, ultimately leading us to victory in San Jacinto. That happened right here. A simple turn to the left and we may not have a Texas at all. That's the story of New Kentucky. While every green space offers opportunities to explore, let's head down to the Kleb Woods Nature Preserve. This Harris County Park occupies over 130 acres of woodland and wetland habitat, along with just enough danger to be exciting. It's a chance to get outside and breathe some fresh air. Eastern red cedar. This is definitely not the kind of scrubby cedars we have in the hill country. The pines, the cedars, the oaks, they're all part of what makes this stretch of Texas beautiful. Wow. I mean, this whole pond is glowing green. And if you look at it, it's not algae. It's like these little bitty plants that are growing on top of the water, almost like little tiny lily pads. They've got roots and everything. And these things along the shore, growing up, we used to call them devil's fingers because it was like the devil reaching his fingers up out of the earth to grab you and pull you back in. I guess they're actually the roots of some of these really tall trees and we probably just said that to scare each other. You know, all it takes is just a little bit of green space to block out the developed world and give everyone just a little bit of breathing room. <sighs> you see the little frogs? As you walk around this pond, you can hear them go beep and <laughs> jump back into the water. Okay, so you may be wondering, Pleb Woods, now how'd it get its name? Well, as you can probably guess, that's another story. It all goes back to a man known as Old Cleb. Elmer Cleb, to be exact. He was a quiet man, born here on site in 1907 when it was his family's homestead, and he never left. Cleb was one with nature, a friend to all woodland creatures. He lived out here with no electricity and no running water up until the 1980s. Elmer was completely off the grid, or at least he thought. The tax man saw things differently. And one day came to Old Cleb and handed him a bill for over $150,000. Old Cleb was up a creek, but he didn't seem to care. He'd never asked the government for anything, so why did they demand something from him? Well, word spread, and Old Cleb's plight became a national news story. And in light of the growing wave of support, Old Cleb and the tax man struck a deal. No more bill, and Old Cleb could keep his land until he died, at which point it would become a public park. And when he finally passed in 1999, that's exactly what happened. Today, visitors can walk through Elmer Cleb's house, where park staff keep Old Cleb's legacy alive proving that it is possible to live off the grid, just not off the books, the tax books. You know, they say the only thing certain in life are death and taxes, but there's another. That if the day tripper crew is on the road, we're gonna eat, which is exactly why we're headed to Mel's Country Cafe. One smell of this place and you'll become a believer. Just like everyone else clamoring to get in this place. Texas country cooking isn't hard to find, but there's only one that does it like Mel's, which is why it's landed in Texas monthly for both burgers and chicken fried steak. So is this Mel's famous chicken fried? Yes. Actually, it's this piece and that piece together. No, that was one chicken fried steak? Yep. That's insane. And they're all you can eat catfish is good. Pretty much everything they have here is good. <laughs> so you went with the catfish, I see. Yes, this is my weekly Friday night catfish. Nice. That looks good, a little southern tradition. I want a chicken fried steak, I want a catfish, I want a burger. 
Well, you're going to walk away with 20 pounds heavier when you leave here tonight. That's kind of what I do, though. That's <laughs> The red tablecloths and friendly faces make Mel seem like one big family picnic, with owner Jeff Henry and his wife Mel bringing the food. What, what keeps this place going? Uh, doing everything from scratch. My wife and I, when we first opened, we wanted big portions. People can split plates, but everything made from scratch. Cooking to order, peeling our own potatoes. The old school way, huh? Uh, it takes a lot more labor, but it, to us, that's why we're busy, you know. It's all handmade, but fresh ingredients doesn't necessarily mean it's good for you. Case in point, the Mega Mel. We actually had one called the Mel Burger that was named after his three patties and a half a pound of bacon. And this guy came in and he's like, that's not big enough. My wife's like, well, I'll make you something big enough. And she came up with a Mega Mel. A burger behemoth. Conquer it in two hours and you get immortal fame on the wall. But be warned, only the strong, or perhaps dumb, survive. Sir, what are you doing? Killing myself slowly. <laughs> no, I'm you have your sure. cardiologist on speed dial. The amount of bacon at the top of this thing is baffling. You've got a whole garden at the bottom here. We do. You know, I've never been the wisest man, but I'm certainly no coward. Uh, I've already eaten way too much today. I should have thought about this yesterday. Only one way to find out if I'm Mega Mel material. I guess you need an extra plate because this is a burger that more than one person should eat. So this is the Mega Mel. It's a pound and a half of beef one full pound of bacon, looks like two tomatoes, about three jars of pickles, two and a half heads of lettuce, and one bun. <laughs> so I got two hours, mark it. I gotta be done with this thing by eight. So I think my only hope is just to start deconstructing and eating. To start things out, I'm gonna make myself a really delicious cheeseburger. Let's do a, we'll do a, a, a double cheeseburger. Put a little bit of tomato on it, bottom bun. I kinda built that upside down, but that's okay. Oh man, that by itself is one of the most delicious, juicy, flavorful burgers I've ever had. Lots of awesome, warm and gooey American cheese. One burger down, but my stomach is already filling up. Time to get creative. We're gonna do a lettuce bacon wrap. Here we go, lettuce bacon wrap. That could work. Now, how about a bacon taco? Who needs a tortilla shell, right? Just, just get your bacon, put some meat on it. That one was pretty good. Brainstorm, burger kebabs. Maybe, maybe some pickle. Then uh, let's do some tomato, some bacon on there, cheeseburger meat. Finish it off with more cheeseburger meat and more bacon. You know what it kind of tastes like? All the last 12 things that I've made out of it. This is just too much. Oh man, it looks like immortal fame just isn't for me. And this, my friends, is the white flag of surrender. I'm done. Cut her off. Mega Mel has defeated me. Oh, I am not really mobile at this point, but I gotta keep moving to our final stop, Main Street Crossing. More than a concert stage, this is a listening room and one of the best in Texas at that. Started by a local church and now attracting big names to this small space for those that appreciate the art of live music. On any night, the bill could include Texans like Joe Ely, Del Watson, or others like Pam Tillis and Todd Snyder. Tonight, it's Houston's own Mighty Orc. So I'm gonna grab a cold one and ingest some live music while I digest that burger. What a day. We rode in by train, flew in by plane, and walked around by trail, all while tripping one of the best kept secrets in Texas. Tomball may no longer be small, but it is certainly a ball. I think the band's about to go on. So I'll see all y'all out on the road. Bye, con Dios, amigos. They loved the railroad so much here that they even renamed the town from Tech, Texas, from Tech, Texas. Tech, Texas, that's in Lubbock. You see, as Sam Houston led the Texan army in the, all of the, in the, <laughs> I need to say Texie in. All right, so this is Don Price. He's the wing leader of the commemorative Air Fo, Fo, Fos, Fos? Yeah. Is that how you say it? Air Force. Air Force. <laughs> 
Wait, was I out of frame? I didn't feel out of frame. Oh, the journey has left me parched. I wonder where I can find a spot of tea. Oh, no. <laughs> I just ripped the beads off the back. I went like this and went <laughs> Oh, God. All right. Howdy, y'all. Follow along with my adventures at Chet Tripper on Instagram and at the Day Tripper TV on Facebook and YouTube. Or head to thedaytripper.com for travel guides, past episodes, and info on our mobile app and Team Day Tripper. This episode was made for y'all with the help of our awesome partners. Check the caption for more info. Howdy, y'all. Chet the Day Tripper here. Thanks so much for tripping with us. Uh, remember, while you're here, like this video, subscribe to our channel so that we can stay out there on the road and keep on tripping. <laughs> Did we miss anything in this town? Leave us a comment, let us know. We love finding out about new stops with all of your tips. And if you love Epic Texas Day Trips, remember to check our channel. We got a lot of them on there. Also, don't forget, if you want some sweet Day Tripper merch or another cool Texas made product, Come see us in Georgetown at the Day Tripper World Headquarters. You can also shop online if you check the link down there in the caption. All right, y'all. Bye, con Dios, amigas.